Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. Today's pre-class video will go over uh, Wolfson Chapter 7, the first three sections. So this chapter is really a direct continuation of the previous chapter on energy. Uh, this is going to starts with conservative and non-conservative forces, and the second section is on potential energy, which is a really important form of energy. It's a little bit more abstract than kinetic. And then third section on conservation of mechanical energy, which is a new way of solving problems in a very, uh, very powerful way. So the quote above says that a conservative force is a force that gives back energy uh, by do transferred by doing work. So, for example, if you look at the, uh, the waterfall up there, there was work done on that water by the sun to evaporate it, lift it up into the air. It rained back down at high ground, and then that energy gets transferred back into kinetic energy as the water falls. And that's, that's an example of using potential energy to store energy. So first I want to uh, go over the definition of conservative and non-conservative forces. So we said before, a conservative force stores any work done against it and can give back the stored work as kinetic energy. For a conservative force, the work done in moving between two points is independent of the path. So that's a property of all conservative forces. If you go from point A to point B along uh, this path, it'll con it'll the conservative force will do some work. If you do a different path, doesn't matter what it is, as long as it ends up at point B, then the work there is the same. W uh, W equals W. And because of that, uh, if you go in from say point A to point B, do some work W A B, then going from point B back to point A, no matter what path you take, will do the work negative W A B. So that means the total work uh, done in going from A all the way back to A is zero. So this is uh, shows an integral sign uh, that is over a closed path of F dot dr, that's the work on this closed path always equals zero. And a non-conservative force is just a force that does not store the work against it. You can't recover uh, the work done by non-conservative force. So, for example, there was some kinetic friction done when this car was skidding along. Uh, it locked up to all four wheels and it was going very fast and then slowed down to a stop. Screech! And then stopped over there. And it was creating a lot of heat. It obviously marked up the pavement. A lot of sound was created. All that energy initial kinetic energy from the car is now lost and you can't somehow reverse the process and get all that heat back to, to get the car moving again. So examples of conservative forces include gravity, uh, the electric force, and the force of an ideal spring. We'll talk mostly about the spring force and gravity force in this chapter. Examples of non-conservative forces would be friction. I just talked about that. The heat it can, uh, heat produced by friction can't be recovered. Uh, the pushing force of a human or animal, that's, that's using up some chemical energy inside, uh, inside your muscles. You can't, uh, that doesn't come from, from anywhere, any easy to define potential. An automobile engine, also you're burning gas there, it seems as if the energy comes from, from the outside. So uh, stored energy, for example, can do some work. And an example of that is that if she stretches this bow, then the bow can, this string can now do work and, and launch that, that arrow. Or if you have a slingshot and you stretch a rubber band, that can then uh, launch a rock. Another example of potential energy for gravitational would be uh, the potential due to elevated position. So I've placed my coffee mug up my bookshelf there and it's precariously perched so that even if I knock this a little bit uh, then the gravity can do work on the cup causing it to speed up as it falls and then smash all over the floor. Also the water at the top of Niagara Falls, we talked about that. That is up there so gravity has now the potential to do work on the water and speed it up as it falls. Hi there, so I want to do a quick uh, demonstration before we continue. Uh, what you can see here is I've got two masses, they're carts um, A and B, they have the same mass and if I let them go, well they just sit there, right? They don't, uh, they don't speed up. If I take this spring, however, and I connect it to, whoop, connect it to uh, around these two carts, let's do this, yeah. 
Okay, now there's an interaction force between these two carts, and there's an equal and opposite force. Uh, there's a force on A pulling it towards the right, a force on B pulling it towards the left, so that in each of these cases, the force will act in the motion of the displacement, will cause, it will do work, positive work on both objects, causing them both to speed up. So if I let these go, boom, okay, they, they move. So here's a schematic showing the exact same thing. You've got mass A and mass B, and you've got the spring force, or it could be maybe the gravity force, something attractive, action-reaction pair of forces. And there are two ways that we can define a system here to consider the energy. System one would be A and B, um, so draw a boundary around A, a boundary around B, and don't consider the spring or the, what these forces are. So now these forces, FB on A and FA on B, are external forces. And so the work done by these two forces changes the system's ex external energy. It inputs energy to the system. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, another way of looking at it is to draw the boundary around the entire thing and include the interaction. Okay. So now uh, there's no external forces. These are both internal forces, so we have to say that the energy is constant here. And the only way we can do that is if we say that the work done by this is equal to negative the change in some potential energy U. So we, we define a potential energy, and we say that when uh, these forces do work, it, ch it changes, and in fact it decreases the potential energy. So the uh, way we define it is we say that the change in potential energy for this force AB uh, is negative of the work done from uh, point A to point B of uh, F dot dr. So potential energy change is independent of the path. Remember, because this is a conservative force, this only works for conservative forces. Uh, it only changes in potential energy uh, have physical meaning. And we are also free to set the zero point of potential energy at any convenient point. So first example would be elastic potential energy. Uh, that's work done from a spring. And we've solved in the previous video that the work done by a spring is 1 half kx squared, so or negative 1 half kx squared. So we'll say that the elastic potential energy is 1 half kx squared, where x is the amount of stretch or compression of the spring away from its equilibrium position. And we've defined here the zero point of elastic potential energy to be when the spring is in equilibrium. So you can make a graph here of x. This is the position where the end of the spring is in equilibrium, no force. That's a minimum potential energy. If you stretch the spring, its potential energy goes up. If you compress the spring, its potential energy goes up. So let's see if you've got it. A spring has a spring constant of 100 newtons per meter. How much potential energy does it store when you stretch it by x equals 10 centimeters? Uh, please pause the video, work that out, and then resume, and I'll, I'll show you the answer. Okay, so hopefully you got 0.5 joules. The steps here are first converting to SI units. x equals 10 centimeters. I converted that to meters by dividing by 100. Uh, 0.1. Um, remember the equation for potential energy stored in a spring is 1 half kx squared. x squared is 0.1 times 0.1, 0 0.01, so you've got a half times 100 newtons per meter times 0 0.01 uh, meters squared. These are all now in SI units, and you get uh, 0 0.5. The SI unit of energy is joules. Okay, so in gravitational potential energy, uh, we're going to work out I guess the path just going straight up a vertical path. So remember, it doesn't matter which path we choose for this book going down to the floor. It could go up along this path or straight out and then straight down. Uh, but we can calculate the change in potential energy more easily with this straight vertical path. So that's the one we'll use. Uh, it's mg times delta y. Gravitational potential energy increases linearly with height y. and that reflects that there's a constant gravitational force near the Earth's surface. Next step is to define mechanical energy. Now that we have kinetic and potential, the sum of kinetic plus potential energy is what we call mechanical energy. And that leads us 
to the last section, conservation of mechanical energy, we're in 7.3. And that's this idea that the initial, or at time one, of kinetic plus potential equals the final kinetic plus potential. That's if the, uh, the only conservative forces are acting on the system. So example, this diver just steps off the diving board very gently so that she doesn't, she's not going up or down. Her kinetic energy, her speed is zero, so her kinetic energy is zero. But she's high up, she's climbed up this ladder, so she has a potential energy, let's say, of 10,000 joules. As she falls, what happens is that potential energy drops. So a quarter of the way down, she now only has 7,500 joules of potential energy. And correspondingly, she speeds up, and now she has 2,500 joules of kinetic energy falls more, uh, potential energy keeps dropping, kinetic energy keeps increasing, but notice that the sum is always the same. It's always 10,000 joules. So that by the time she gets to the bottom zero height, uh, she's got zero potential energy, and her kinetic energy is up at 10,000 joules. Uh, Wolfson uses a lot of energy bar charts, so that's where you uh, do a little bar showing uh, K and U. Uh, idea here is that if you throw a pebble straight up, it goes up, comes back down. These are shown at different times. Uh, initially, all of its energy is kinetic because it's at zero height. And as it goes up, I guess halfway up, it's got uh, half kinetic, half potential energy. At the top, it has zero kinetic energy, and all that energy is U. The same same height there, this is this dotted line. And then on the way back down, it gets converted again. So these two um, forms of energy balance each other when you add them up. Another interesting uh, application or demonstration they talk about in the book is this bowling ball. So this woman holds a bowling ball to her nose. Uh, it's attached to the ceiling up, up high on a hook somewhere. She lets go and uh, it swings down, swings away from her, and then swings back up to the same height. And since it started with zero kinetic energy because she dropped it from rest, when it comes back up it'll go to zero speed and it won't bonk her in the nose. So she doesn't have to flinch or duck or anything. Still, I think that's a pretty brave thing to do. So, another question for you. Can a system have negative potential energy? I'm not going to read through those answers for you, but two are no, three are yes. Choose the best answer, and I'll tell you what I, what I think. So press pause, and when you resume, I'll give you the answer. Okay, so it, it is yes that uh, any, a system can have negative potential energy, and that's because it doesn't matter where you choose a zero potential energy. Uh, total energy can also be negative or positive, um, so C and D were not the best answers. So here's an example of Amber and Bill. And there's a one kilogram rock that, I don't know how, but it's, it's at this instant, it's one meter above the ground. Now, Amber has a sensible coordinate system where she sets the zero height, or zero Y, to be at the ground. And so she would say, well, this rock is one meter up, so uh, MGH, uh, mass is 1 kilogram, G is 9.8 times 1 meter. She says, this rock has 9.8 joules of potential energy. And she'd be correct. Now Bill is a bit of a weird guy. He says that Y equals 0 is right at this sort of his belly button level, which happens to be 1 meter off the ground. And so he says, uh, MG times Y, uh, mass 1, Y is 0, so... Uh, the potential energy is zero. So he says this rock has zero potential energy. And he's also right. In his coordinate system, this rock has zero potential energy. But if the rock were to fall down to the ground, Amber would say now it's got zero uh, joules of, kinetic, of potential energy, so it would speed up. And Bill would say, well, as it falls, now it's got negative 9.8 joules of potential energy when it hits the ground. In both cases, the rock has lost 9.8 joules of potential energy as it fell that one meter, both in Amber's and Bill's coordinate system. So the point here is that it doesn't matter where you set your zero point. Physically, what matters is only the changes in potential energy. So let's go over Wolfson's problem solving strategy, this IDEA. So first step is interpret the problem, make sure that all the forces are conservative, so conservation of mechanical energy applies here. Uh, identify the quantity that you're being asked to find, write down your knowns and unknowns. Um, 
draw the object in a situation where you can determine both its kinetic and potential energy and then make another drawing in the situation where something's unknown. And then you set up your equation E1 equals E2. And what that means is that uh, the kinetic one plus potential one equals the kinetic two plus potential two. These things are the same by conservation of energy. And these are two different times T1 and T2. So then you evaluate this equation, solve for the unknown quantity, which might be an energy, a spring stretch, could be a velocity, and then finally assess your solution. Look, um, look to make sure your answer makes some sense, consistent with your intuition, has the right units, etc.